Good morning and welcome to this supplementary interview of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development's High Level Food Systems event. I'm Jim Woodhill, a Senior Policy Advisor to the Platform and Honorary Research Associate at Oxford University Environmental Change Institute. Joining us this morning is Martin Bradler, Head of the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, CADA. Martin has vast experience of agriculture and food issues across Africa, and in particular, in negotiating projects and programs with donors. Unfortunately, at the last moment, Martin was unable to join the high level event last week, but has very kindly agreed to add his voice to the extremely interesting panel discussion we had. Martin, welcome and good to be talking with you again. Martin, the food- so Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Um, Martin, the UN Food Systems Summit is really highlighting the sort of fundamental transformation that will be needed in food systems for them to provide healthier diets, to be more inclusive, to protect people's livelihoods, to have a, a better environment and, and to be more resilient. Um, donors obviously have critical roles in helping to support that transformation, but perhaps need to reorientate the way they work. I'm wondering if you'd like to share with us just to, to kick off this discussion, what you think are the three most important things donors should focus on in really optimizing the role that they can play. Thank you so much, Jim, and uh, happy to join you in this conversation. Uh, on your question, let me start by saying that uh, when the Food Systems Summit was announced late last year, uh, the African Union took up to engage and support member states, especially in the convening and undertaking of the national dialogues. And the African Union Development Agency has been upfront uh, working with the, we ended up at the moment working with 47 countries, uh, very intensive following with them on their national dialogues and all that. But specifically to your question is that uh, when we started that process late last year into most of the first quarter of this year, the response from the countries was very, very slow and very low. Uh, maybe not slow and low, but let me say that the countries were asking and hesitating to say, what is this? What does it mean? Uh, what do we get out of it? Uh, on one side. On the other side, they were saying, we have uh, the SDGs, we have Agenda 2063, we have uh, CADAP Malabo, and all these have articulated quite sufficiently if it's just about what are the objectives, what are the issues. So what will be the value of this uh, UN food system? In hindsight, when we look at it now, we actually appreciate that the countries that challenged more this process have actually gone much deeper in terms of their own thinking, their own resolve, their own commitment and understanding of what are we talking about now. And actually the quality of, of outcomes from these processes is even very, very profound in these countries that were asking those difficult questions. Now, because of that, and when you look at those questions from the countries, we also reflected quite in depth in terms of what will be the value of the UN food systems this time around for Africa, for in Africa, and about the economic and social development in the continent. Uh, and this is speaking to then what can the donors be doing? Uh, one of the things that has come out through and through is that, uh, and most countries have used this process not to come up with another list of priorities per se, but to examine issues of implementation. What is holding the countries at all levels, subnational, national, the region, the continent, moving on the priorities, on the issues that they know very well, that could even be very compelling, but implementation is not happening as well as everybody, anybody would wish. And actually, we have tried to direct a lot of discussion to understanding this issue of implementation, uh, as well as what is driving or blocking, and then what can we do to actually unblock and accelerate implementation. 
Now, uh, if you look at that, one issue that is very critical is actually capacity at sub-national level, capacity at decentralized government level. And you're talking about both government in terms of public service delivery, uh, when you are talking about uh, building business and private sector entities, just the whole element of registering a company in some countries will take you hours, other countries it will take you months and, and even a, a close to a year. So those elements are actually critical to uh, enhancing implementation. So the, I'm making the point here that is about the capacity at sub-national level, at the decentralized government level. And this is also recognizing that uh, going forward, a lot of actual implementation sustainably, and you're talking about systemic capacity in the countries, uh, is something that we need to focus at sub-national level, at decentralized government level, because this is where you're going to reach a very huge part of the capacity of the constituency in Africa that can make a difference. And these are not beneficiaries per se, they're actually players to that food systems in terms of its success. We normally recognize them as the, as the victims, as the culprits of, of the broken food systems. But these are also the constituencies that are going to have to do something to mend that food system. So I'm talking about a majority of the small medium enterprises, most of them as you would recognize informal, I'm talking about the food vendors. I'm talking about that guy in the small shop selling uh, agricultural inputs. Uh, and these are the constituencies that uh, we are talking about in terms of what can we do and where should the donors be focused. Now, when I say capacity at centralized level, I'm talking about uh, planning capacity, uh, monitoring and evaluation. I'm talking about management skills uh, and those kind of capabilities that uh, ultimately are enhancing accountability and, and coordination, in fact, also at that level. So let me pause here for now. Yeah. Great, thank you, Martin. I mean, super interesting. And I think that actually does bring another dimension. We had last week in the panel, quite a lot of discussion about the importance of country-led, country-owned processes and coordination at the country level, but perhaps not quite such a, a, a focus on the local level that you're talking about as being, being really important. I mean, in, in that, Martin, I can hear two things coming through. I mean, one, one is the importance of um, the enabling environment, and the other one is just the, the having actual capabilities of individuals and organisations to do the work, which yeah, perhaps comes back to the, um, the thinking around what sort of investment is needed to achieve these capacities at that local level and what sort of change policy environment is needed to, to underpin that and how do you think uh, donors can support both of those two elements in partnership with national governments? Yeah, yeah, actually that is a critical part. And uh, I would say that uh, specifically, and we're trying to identify some of these things, specifically when you talk about policy, there are aspects that relate to, to market development. And there's a lot of policy aspects there that can actually not necessarily provide a, a preferential kind of treatment, but a, a incentives that go uh, at the level of the, the greater good, the public good, and, the, and incentives in the sense that for government, it may actually look like some loss in the short term but that will be what is necessary to achieve sustainable growth in those areas. So policies on things like market development, like uh, enhancing access to technologies for small medium enterprises. And, and these are about the cost of technology, the mechanisms that will allow for the technology transfer. Uh, and some of those can actually be incentivized through policy intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we also know, for instance, today the whole issue of digitalization, and there's a lot of capability that can come in there, including just mere access to information. If you find in one of these countries just the cost of data is an hindrance in itself, uh, and uh, some interventions at policy level can make those things much more accessible and practical for small and medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. okay. So thinking both about that local level, but perhaps across the continent more generally, 
Um, the Cirrus yeah. report, for example, has said that I think it's in the order of 13 or 14 billion a year needs to be spent by donors to try and achieve SDG2. And I think that that needs to be complemented by some 33 billion by, by national governments. I mean, is there just a big um, funding shortfall in trying to achieve these objectives? Or actually, is it more just about doing things in a smarter way and, and getting the policy environment right? Um, there are a number of things that have to be done. And again, you have to embrace those uh, decentralized government systems. Because uh, one of the things there is that uh, they are at the forefront of implementation. And when you speak to those people in, those, uh, in that category, actually you already begin to realize that they are already doing a lot of systems approach. Because at that level, it's not so much this and that sector going on their own. It's actually, they already are dealing with how to bring together different sectors. Because at that level of implementation, you need to connect, you need to combine, you need the synergies, complementarities across different sectors. That's one. The second part is that you need to also have the inclusive systems because many of the players are ultimately is about, about power relations uh, and the constituencies that matter, that will actually embrace policy also to the level of implementation. Uh, then uh, you are almost guaranteed that they will be part to that equation uh, in the formulation, in the implementation, in the evaluation of policy. So again, another area that the government can actually incentivize and pay attention to is the inclusiveness practically. We talk about it every day, but it's not every day that is happening in the right way in terms of bringing the right people in the right part of the equation in that policy formulation. As you may appreciate, and actually cases like I'll give an example of a country like South Africa, for instance, and the, there are many like that. It's, the issue is far, far from resources availability. It's about accountability, allocation of resources in the right places at the right time. And some of those things improve immediately. You get more constituencies implicated, participating in those policy formulation, in those investment choices that they have to make at that level. Uh, and therefore, what you are getting is the improved delivery, but also uh, improved value for money that is being made available. So if I, if I understand you correctly, you're talking about the need for some very fundamental processes and the way different actors in the food system work together at the local level. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Uh, very much so. But uh, one point is, especially when uh, we are speaking to development partners, it is also within that context is to appreciate that what I'm talking about now may not exactly fit in the traditional funding mechanisms. Yeah. When you're talking about projects that are one year, that are sort of sector based and the period of one year, two years, three years. But we're talking about appreciating some medium to long term, looking at elements of systemic change in capability to deliver. Mm -hmm. But also we recognize, and this is why at the end of the day, it's also partners, donors, looking out for very clear public private branded kind of solutions mm -hmm. because the public sector side of it has to carry the long term a, a thrust a, a within which then some donor interventions, because they probably for many reasons may not say I commit for the next 10 years, 15 years. But if they have commitment for three years, we need to have a system that can receive that three years, use it up effectively, efficiently, contributing to medium to long term. So that public private branded situation is also something that is very, very useful and important. And here I'm saying to the donors that it's not just about uh, the volumes of money, it's also about the mechanism we are using uh, in terms of funding tools, funding instruments that can uh, actually help to move systemic change in systemic capacity. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So what, what would be some of those funding mechanisms and modalities you'd like to see changed? Or, you know, what is it that donors could fundamentally be doing differently to really help this vision you have of a much more effective local local capacity? And we're, and we're sort of friends here, Martin, so we can be a bit honest. I could see you smiling there for a moment and wondering how cautious to be about criticising donors. But, I mean, I think we're going to need a, an open conversation about how things could be, could be different and be more effective into the future. Yeah. Well, and uh, fortunately, I do understand some of the considerations that come also on the donor side, including uh, expectations from their own governments, from their own populations. But I think uh, something that uh, if we can hold on in the short term, uh, we will be able to even present to our taxpayers in the developed world, actually the real result that they themselves can be happy and say, our money was better used. But how do we do that? I'm saying that in the meantime, there will be things like uh, to get much more uh, basket funding into local uh, sub-national systems. Uh, and of course, we, we need to work together, both public, private, uh, and development partners in terms of strengthening capabilities, like I said, for planning, for resource allocations and accountability so that out of those uh, uh, public, uh, I mean, uh, branded public, private and donor financing, everybody's comfortable, everybody's happy that the resources will be say, will serve the purpose that it was meant to. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to say that in the development partner, sometimes there's hesitation in terms of, of funding that looks like going directly into enhancing private sector capability. But uh, as I was saying, we need to grow the domestic private sector constituency uh, for the success of these food systems we're talking about. Uh, and and uh, some of that can actually be accelerated by direct collaboration between the private sector, domestic private sector, mm -hmm. probably also corporate uh, private sector multinationals, the local government, and, and the traditional donors, uh, our bilateral governments. Uh, so it's about the bilaterals actually opening up more even in terms of their financing instruments to engage directly into those uh, private enhancing, okay, business uh, enhancing uh, capabilities uh, uh, investments. Uh, and of course, the, the last point I would make here is that uh, in those public-private branded solutions, then you can actually get much more enabling uh, environment and allow government to focus more on the long-term capital investments. Uh, well, as because government is also pressured in terms of the results for today, the people will not wait for tomorrow. They also have the same challenges. Uh, but in that branded, then some of the private and and the donor funding can. Uh, uh, mitigate the immediate needs and allow government funding to go into more long-term like roads, like communication, uh, uh, like healthcare facilities and those kind of things. At the moment, Africa actually broadly across the whole continent needs massive investments in the, in the local processing, food processing infrastructure and those kind of things. Okay. Yeah. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how you would see the connection between the local level capacity, and you've made a very strong case that really it's at the local level, subnational level where the rubber hits the road. But what sort of activities and coordinations do you think are needed at the national level and perhaps at the regional or even the global level to actually make this local uh, level work effectively? And I guess one of the discussions we had the other day was about the importance of donor coordination at the national level. So you know, how do you yeah. see this local level connecting into the other various levels to get things yeah. working in the way that you would hope they might in the future? Yeah, uh, actually what we are seeing and, uh, and sort of maybe compelled, probably they have no, no other ways that in the countries where you get stronger subnational governments operating, the national governments begin to listen, begin to respond, begin to adjust to actually provide for the needs of those subnational level entities. Uh, and therefore, uh, 
the, there is a skill set that you need at national level there, uh, in terms of planning, in terms of monitoring capabilities. Uh, I'll give you an example. Today we are working with some private sector on a digital capability for monitoring uh, or not monitoring, let me just say for management of educational resources. There are countries where they are putting in so much money into primary education, but nobody knows how many pupils are sitting in that class, how many teachers are available, how many are actually reporting uh, and knocking off after 30 minutes and uh, kids who are not able to come because of either distance and all that. Uh, and we are saying with a digital capability and the mobile phone that many of these people will have, there will be a link between that class teacher, the district officer, the national officer, and everybody in between in a kind of real time. Mm -hmm. And what that provides, especially for the teacher at the front line there, is actually in the beginning, it looks like he's being inspected and all that, and they may even resist but they begin to be incentivized. They look like they can press a button and speak to the minister and send a message to the minister. They can press a button, but the end result of that is a very systematic accountability process. You, we know, for instance, in the, in the countries where we already beginning, that you find that there are books in one location of the, of the country uh, and there's zero in another location. If this one has access, this one has zero, but with this capability, they will be able to say, we need so much in this location. You can even move things around in that context. Mm -hmm. And that is where now the national governments actually need to be, be responsive. So one of the big skill capability that national governments require is to be responsive, to listen, to understand what the local governments are saying, and respond accordingly in terms of resource allocation, in terms of policy options, in terms of investment options. And uh, in that way, actually, uh, when you are looking at national, uh, I mean, donor uh, working groups at national level, is actually to work with national governments in terms of that capability to be able to have clear, strong monitoring systems. Uh, review systems and even learning, but also the link between uh, uh, the, the local government and the national government. We have just done an exercise also with the, some of our collaborators in, in Uganda. You find that in fact planning at sub-national level is so, it, it becomes easy, easy because it's so practical and so factual. You are not using averages at national level. Yeah. You are using actually real data that you can actually see it on the ground. Well, as the more you begin to go to national level and you are using averages, then some of that you end up giving somebody books because the national average says books and when they, what they need is pencils. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, there, there is something that has to happen. I, and I'm not, I shouldn't imply that forget about the national system. Uh, they are part of the equation, and we need to also consider them at the same time, in the same vein, and same energy. Uh, but the ultimate is that there is that, uh, uh, as you put it, where the rubber hits the tarmac, that that space is being up, uh, enabled, incentivized, and they are also even in the process, in the in the in the position to call some of the accountability that you talk about of yeah. national governments. Right. I mean, you've mentioned uh, national uh, agricultural coordination committees and working groups and so on, but uh, you know, it would seem sometimes that's not always working. And I think also we've potentially had the problem, we've had agricultural working groups rather than food systems working groups, which brings it all together. But what would be your vision for the way donors could work better at a, a coordinated national level to support this sub-national implementation? Yes, actually. And, and by the way, we are working on the, on the implementation mechanism for the food systems work. Uh, I use the word mechanism kind of deliberately because we don't want to imply that we are coming up with another framework. We have the CADAP Malabo framework, 
but uh, it needs to be adjusted. And one of the areas where it has to be adjusted is how the CADAP Malabo framework connects with environment in a very systemic way. It's not a by the way issue. Uh, and it's also in a very practical because theoretically we all are convinced. There's, I think very few people would push back on the theoretical linkages and, and importance to link. But practically, uh, how do we connect with environment? Uh, at the moment, countries have got NDCs, for instance, uh, they've got other national uh, strategies on environment. How do we connect with the uh, social protection? How do we connect with the food security uh, and nutrition where they are actually separate uh, national strategies? So we're trying to say, uh, first and foremost, is how do we practically get the CADA framework to recognize and operate in the manner that is not just agriculture and food security, it's actually all these other elements, especially and including uh, manufacturing, I mean, uh, processing, value adding and all that. Uh, and as I said, at, at, uh, at frontline, at sub-national level, it's not as complicated at national level. Yeah. yeah? And, and uh, that is one thing, but uh, that has to happen and it can't be, uh, it won't happen by itself. There has to be very intentional interventions to get CADAP to come to appreciate and operate in a, in a food systems way. That is one bit we are bringing in into our mechanism. The other part is that, uh, as you said, this is donor working groups and the sector working groups. Uh, they actually talk about coordination, but I think uh, in my view, that is the least thing they, they actually achieve. There's a lot of very nice talk and sharing information but actually responding to say, my colleague is doing this, so I can't, I have to do the other way or this other way and actually make the real coordination come up is, is also not that easy to actually achieve. And, and uh, this is also why we think that operating from the ground, uh, we will be able to compel because there is some level of coordination uh, is not uh, as well. And of course, there are also challenges there but in the sub-national level, the, 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 for lack of a better word, those self-interests across different organizations and sectors are not as heavy uh, as they are at national level. So we, we also are saying that uh, one of the things is, is to find those neutral platforms. So it can't be an agriculture platform. It can't be an environment platform. It can't be a, processing industrial, but a neutral platform where the responsibility is actually to negotiate the different interests mm -hmm. and uh, help everybody appreciate their win-win. And in fact, is to push them to the level where they know that if agriculture dies, then the mean industry, I will die as well. So I need industry, I need social protection, I need jobs for the people uh, and, and therefore, appreciate why I need to work with the others. And some of these platforms we see in some countries actually in the appointment of their national conveners, they actually appointed people that are in a kind of a neutral platform. Uh, uh, some of the neutral platforms at continental level, I mean, at national level is systems that come either in the ministries of economic planning, because they kind of manage the whole portfolio of government a Minister of Economics, but also under like Prime Minister's office, it varies from country to country. But uh, we believe that in every country there is a space where uh, somebody has the convening power to bring many sectors together. Right, very, very, very interesting, Martin. And um, one of the things the donor platform has been wondering about is whether establishing some sort of working group to think much more about how to take forward this country level coordination. So it sounds like you would be uh, fully supporting that sort of thinking by the platform. Yes, no, definitely. And this is what I'm saying that uh, I, I think we need to be bold and think differently. Yep. It's not, I, I, I fully understand it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, and that's why you need people to sit down and uh, look at uh, the pros and cons, the gains and the, and the implications, there will be a lot of things that uh, you have to go business unusual. And, and of course, some of the existing energy will be working against that. 
So it, it, it will also vary from country to country. But once we establish the guiding two, three, four principles, then you can domesticate it and see how it works from country to country. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Martin, I feel we could go on and spend the whole day talking about all of these issues because you just have such a wealth of knowledge and experience about what's what's needed. But we probably should start thinking about uh, wrapping up and we'll certainly come back to you for more detail as we think about developing the white paper for the global donor platform. Um, but I'm wondering just before we wrap up whether there's you know, a couple of other things you would like to, to mention that you think is really critical for donors to uh, keep at the forefront of their minds as they start responding to the outcomes of the Food System Summit? Yeah, uh, actually just last part, I was talking about monitoring capability and all that. What we are also getting from the countries, I mentioned we are working with 47. What we are mentioning is that they very well appreciate, and this has changed quite significantly even over the last 10, 20 years. There's a massive appreciation of quality data, quality analysis, and, and also issue of foresight. Actually, countries are asking questions. If I do this policy now, what are the implications five years down the line? What are the implications 10 years down the line? But most of the time, actually, what we are lacking, even here in uh, African Development Agency, is, is actually we're trying to move as quickly as we can in terms of capability to support countries, even just uh, articulate the development questions they're having and link to analysis. Uh, I do know that in Africa, possibly it's not so much that it doesn't exist, but it's very fragmented. It's not coordinated anywhere. There's no one, two, three places where you can find that concentration of analysis, mm -hmm. of capability for foresight work and all that. So, we, I'm speaking also to the development partners that this is an area that may need actually and can, re, can give a lot of results very quickly in the next three, five years. It's a massive investment in the building capability, in the, not just generation, but the use of uh, analysis, quality analysis, foresight, uh, and of course, it, it's based on the available data. And that is also an advantage at sub-national level. At sub-national level, you'll be amazed how much data they have and very, very concrete. Unfortunately, it's not being used as much, but they do collect a lot of that. Okay. Great, fabulous. Thank you so much, Martin. And I think what you've really emphasized is how critical it is to get essentially get the process right. And you don't get yeah. the process right if you don't have the right partnerships, if you don't have the right data, if you don't have the right analysis and trying to pull all that together in an integrated way, both at the sub-national and the national exactly. level. And of course, nobody's going to say, no, we don't need some more resources to help make all of this happen. But I think the very strong message from you is more resources don't mean anything if you don't get the processes right. And, and perhaps then thinking more about how to invest in those processes and invest in the capabilities and the leadership that are needed for those processes to be driven well at, at local and, and national levels. So. Look, Martin, uh, really, really nice to speak with you. Um, thank you so much for your input this morning. We'll certainly add this to the great insights we had from the high level event last week. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with you as uh, part of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim and everybody. So have a good day and looking forward to more interactions and working together. Thank you.